Hey, what's up? This is Scott with Level Up Tutorials, and in this video, we're gonna be doing a questions and answers with questions that you send in to me via comments or emails. So we're gonna take this time to answer a few questions. My wife, Courtney, is going to be asking the questions here, and I'm gonna do my best to give you the best possible answers. I'm also joined by my dogs, Lucy and Sammy, who may <laughs> occasionally get in the way and be super annoying. Yep, this is Lucy the Mop. Lucy the Mop, and then Sammy the Monkey Man. <laughs> All right, so should I just read the questions? Yeah, let's get started. Okay, great. Let's do it. All right, so our first question comes from Kevin. Kevin says, I would be curious to know how you got into web development and what that process was like. Maybe some of the lessons that you learned from that journey as well. This is the dog part. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, I got into web development pretty organically. Uh, it was really just, um, I would be making my own personal website for just having a website, really. I was a music major in college, and uh, pretty much everybody had their own website, so it was really just sort of a necessity. And my first website was filled with uh, tables and bad practices, but at the time it was sort of like how you just made websites, especially if you didn't know any better. So I really made a website and then the next year I made another website because I didn't like that one and the next year I made another one and then eventually I put it on uh, WordPress and then eventually I put it on Drupal and then eventually I wrote my own from scratch. Uh, it just kept Every single year I wanted to make it better and better the more mm -hmm. I learned. But it was it was really like a um I liked I liked doing it and then um I got sort of tired of doing my own website over and over again, maybe like three or four times. So by that point I I started to look for freelance clients um and then started actually really developing my skills more and then looking for a web development actual job. Uh so really it was it's not what I set out to do, but it's really where I, I ended up because it just was what I like to do. I found myself doing it in my free time. Like it, I would come home from work and work on websites. So there was some point where I just was like, why don't I work on websites at work? Because that's really what I like doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it was really an organic process for you, would you say? Yeah, yeah, it just really sort of just happened, I suppose, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any lessons that you learned from your journey? Yeah, I think the lessons that I learned mostly are just uh, go where your energy takes you. Where you personally, I, I found I wanted to work on something, and that led me to something else, which led me to something else. But it was all driven very much by I find this particular topic interesting. So for me you're going to learn more, you're going to learn better, and you're going to learn faster if what you're learning is interesting to you. So don't taste, don't don't waste time pursuing topics that are just tedious to you because in the end, if you, you don't need a particular topic to be a great web developer, you can always narrow your focus and be good at, really good at one particular thing, maybe CSS and HTML and some some basic JavaScript or something, but either way, you're narrowing your focus to what you find interesting, and in the end, you'll be a better developer because of it. Okay, so you're saying follow your passion, right? And not just go for something just because it's hot or yeah. because you think you should learn that? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. There's a lot of trendiness in web development, and, mm -hmm. and some of it is, is fun, and some of it I mean, personally, I really like a lot of the, the trendy stuff, but it it's only because I like to hack away at that stuff and sort of see see how it works and things like that. But it, if that's not you, then then don't waste your time trying to make that be you. All right, awesome. Okay, so our next question is from Danilo. Danilo, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, the question is, what is your workflow like, and how do you stay productive? Do you use any tools that help you in this regard? Um, and he says he often finds himself really overwhelmed and not sure what should be done in a particular project and ends up losing track of what he should do or maybe spends too much time fixing little things that might not be a part of the task. So really, how do you stay productive and like keep in that flow, what would you say? 
Yeah, and this is a uh, a question that hits close to home because I have, as you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I definitely have this problem too. I mean, I, I end up being pretty productive, but really I, I can get in these big ruts where I'm not productive at all and I'm feeling completely disorganized and overwhelmed, especially with larger projects. Uh, for me, the best thing is to always have a list, a to-do list, a list you can scratch off of really definitive things. I use the uh, application and the website Todoist, which is a just a big list-making application. It's really no different than a lot of other checklist applications other mm -hmm. than it, it has just a lot of classifications and things like that, so you can really organize everything. Um, a, a lot of people like to use Trello, which is, uh, I don't know, did you ever, we maybe used Trello a little bit. Yeah, we used it when we moved here, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, so Trello has all these boards where you can move tasks to different boards and yeah. stuff. And I find that maybe more productive using that in a work environment with others rather yeah. than in a single like just myself when i when i have trello just myself i don't use it at all uh so todoist is much easier for me but personally uh i find i work best on a, a to-do list even like a pen and paper i i usually have a notebook i'll write today's date on it um there's a really good book that we both uh listen to uh, was it Eat That Frog? Uh -huh. Eat was it Brian Tracy, right? Brian yeah. Tracy, yeah. It's a uh, great book. Yeah, he really talks about finding this, the one thing that's the most important thing for you to accomplish that day, to eat that frog, which is this big, you know, thing that you have to accomplish today. But maybe it's a very specific task, right? So um, he talks about getting in and just doing that first and biting the bullet, um, but really prioritizing what you need to do make Sammy <laughs> make something your absolute like highest priority and then uh, go from there so for me I, I use Todoist I make a lot of lists some lists end up getting thrown away before they're ever completed uh, <laughs> I, I, I try um, to start each day with making a list there's that whole like Benjamin Franklin morning thing where he like plans out his whole day in the morning uh so a lot of that stuff really really super helps um but for me it's just having concrete things to do and knowing what you can do and staying to those and checking them off uh, anybody who's worked with me ever knows that i am the worst abuser of having like 30 tabs open as well on, on chrome <laughs> like my yeah. my chrome is bad so uh try to stay away from that uh, I'm I'm doing my best to get better at that, but it's you know that's a hard hard thing to break. Really, just make lists, stay focused. Those lists, know what your highest priorities are, and 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 go for them. Yeah, I would just say from a psychological perspective, I don't know if anyone's tried the Pomodoro technique. Yeah, there's different apps that you can download. One is I think for Android, it's like Pama. Pomodoro, or I don't know, but you can yeah. Google that and you work for 25 minutes and stay focused and then you take like a five minute break and you continue that cycle for I think three times and then um, after that third time you get a 10 minute or to 15 minute break, you know, to kind of do what you want, whether that's check email or uh, grab a snack or mm -hmm. go to the bathroom, you know, whatever you need to do, but it really helps you to stay in that flow and they even have some that will block you from being able to check other mm. websites like Facebook or whatever that is. Yeah. So it, it can really help. There's a lot of different techniques out there if you just kind of explore. Yeah, I actually have an app for OSX called Focus actually on that. It's oh, not yeah? it's not a Pomodoro, yeah. but uh, it, it, you can have it set up to block certain applications and websites. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have it block Facebook, Reddit, a whole bunch of stuff so that if I'm really needing to, to zone in, I, I turn that on. And what it does is you get to this website uh, if you go to the website, it pops you up with a quote that's basically shaming you into working. So <laughs> <laughs> I need to use that. <laughs> yeah, funny. yeah. I, I found it to be really effective because I always <laughs> feel really bad when I get the the quote that's like, you know, the hard the hardest working people or whatever, you know. So yeah, uh, uh, we should actually mention too. I don't know if this came up. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this earlier, but uh, Courtney is actually Doctor Talinsky. She's yes. a uh, PhD clinical psychologist here. Yeah, um, and I work mostly with kids and teenagers, but um, I'm also able to give advice and do work with adults. Too. Yeah, yeah. So, 
save the web development questions for this guy, but I can take some mental health questions. Yeah, mental health questions right here. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's continue on to Sanjay. So Sanjay wants to know, is stylus or sass or is it less? Less, yeah. Less best right now. So what do you prefer? <sighs> What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, this is a tough question because like any of these technologies, people like to get into a camp and mm -hmm. like, it's almost like you're on a sports team or you're like waving your flag like go team sass or something <laughs> like that's a big thing and people get really really defensive about whatever technology they they use uh, personally i use stylus in all of my particular projects it has some features that i just like uh it it you know check out the the stylus tutorials on my channel you can see just some of these neat little extras that don't exist in the other preprocessors it's also javascript based and plays nice with everything uh so i believe stylus wins the award for most underrated there's also a huge community and a lot of tools for it yeah so stylus for me is really the the most underrated uh and then you have sass which i feel at this point is really the most likely Preprocessor that you're going to get in, in a, a job interview or when you're looking for work. I feel like uh, any project that I, I've been on that's not using SAS, mm -hmm. uh, I've either lobbied for it to use SAS uh, because that's what most people really know at this point, but it also has the best community, the most amount of people working in it, uh, the best amount of tools. Just like really, uh, SAS really takes the cake in terms of top dog right now um, for CSS preprocessors and for good reason. SAS is great. Uh, LibSAS, which is a non-Ruby based, it's a C based version of SAS is really nice. You can use it with Node really easy with Node SAS. Um, so for me, SAS, SAS wins out. Stylus is most underrated. Uh, it's the most likely I'm going to use. And then bottom of the barrel is Less. Less got a huge adoption rate early because it was bundled into Twitter's Bootstrap. Oh, okay. And uh, and that was really like a a big popular thing. Uh -huh. So a lot of people use Bootstrap and they use Less because it came with it and it was easy to add because there was even like a a JavaScript version that compiled at runtime and instead of. Um, uh, build process so it was easier to get people into it was just all around easier the problem is compared to stylus and less the syntax is clunkier there's less features and the, the community there there's just it's not as good right so st uh, sass and stylus both have better like grid frameworks and extensions and packages like that i would say don't learn less unless you have to for a particular project. Uh, spend your time with SAS. And then if you want to do free time stuff, spend your time with Stylus because I think you might really like it. So they're both used for CSS? They're all three of them are CSS preprocessors. Okay. So essentially they take what you're writing in CSS uh, and give you additional features that don't exist in CSS. Ah. They make your life easier. It makes it faster to write CSS. Um, there's extensions and things like that. Um, and it, that, it takes that code and SAS or Stylus or Less takes that code that you write and transforms it into CSS that the browser can actually read. Okay. Yep. Okay. So that I can understand. Yeah. Otherwise I look at that and I don't know what <laughs> yeah. any of that means. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question from jmac217x. Do you see PHP 7 being competitive in the current web development spectrum? Yeah, what do you I, think? I don't think PHP is going anywhere. I mean, just uh, if you look at so many of the most popular sites uh, on the internet are built with, I mean, WordPress, Drupal, or even Joomla, they're all PHP based. Uh, there's more PHP based systems than we can uh, really like put to end at any point. Mm -hmm. It would, it's gonna take a long time before PHP is, is not like the major language for server side on the web really. I mean, and now you have Laravel, which is uh, taken hold. Laravel is really super cool. Um, there's a lot of just other frameworks. Either way, PHP has such like a, a hold on the web in general that I feel like PHP 7 being, even you know, it's new version, uh, new features, stuff like that. But even though it's, you know, something that people are going to have to implement in their, their workflows and learn, 
I don't think PHP is going anywhere. Uh, so I think learning PHP 7 is definitely a good idea, especially if okay. you want to stay current. So people want to use whatever, whatever's trendy. They want to use Node. They want to use uh, Elixir. They want to use uh, Ruby. They want to use Python. I, Python's not trendy. Neither is Ruby really at this point. Uh, but they want to use these things. But at the end of the day, PHP is so ingrained into how the web is right now. I just don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. So you think it's a still a solid standard for everyone? Yeah, I, I think okay. it's it's a, it's a, a definitely something that you should at least have a good understanding of. I'm not saying you have to learn how to write an app from scratch in PHP. I certainly uh, don't and and haven't. I mean, I have a long time ago, but I, I haven't I haven't really dove into PHP that much, but let's say I'm working on a WordPress site or something and I need to make some modifications to the loop. Do I know how to write the PHP to do that? Certainly. Yeah. So I think it's a, a, a good thing to have PHP in your, in your tool belt and learning the new features in PHP 7 is definitely something that you should be doing. All right. Sounds good. J-Mac, I hope that helps. Cool. So that was a good amount of questions. Well, we have a bunch more bunch more here so we're going to take uh, another video and we'll catch you in part two where we finish answering the rest of the questions <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you there <laughs>